I've seen a lot of Smash Talk by this point. I've watched the series grow from its roots to the monumental occasion it is today, and been personally involved in character speculation from Brawl onward. Many different characters and support bases have come and gone, or stayed, and after a while you start to see patterns and themes that recur every time. Some are interesting, some amusing to watch, some not so much. And there's one phrase in particular that always seems to rear its ugly head any time newcomer talk kicks up again. Who deserves it more? Like clockwork, it's only a matter of time until debates over who will join the fight next devolve into shouting matches over who quote quote deserves to be in Smash the most. We fans have this tendency to turn the roster into some kind of members only club where only the most worthy need apply while the rest of the rabble are shut out. Most of the time it amounts to being wielded as a blunt object to stunt an argument for a character's chances before it's had the chance to be made, to discredit any candidate that the speaker or writer or bandwagon in question thinks shouldn't be allowed to take the grandest stage alongside or in place of characters they personally prefer. Those of us community long runners who've polled for several characters over the course of several games, we've all been on the receiving end of that at least once, I think, right? It gets to the point where the Smash roster itself is seen as some kind of measuring contest of which franchises matter more than others. Talks around which are overrepped and shouldn't steal another slot, or which deserve more reps, as if the social status of each series and their fans hung in the balance. And the most frustrating part is, this isn't how the guy calling the shots views it at all. More than anything, Sakurai is just interested in finding compelling new additions to each new Smash game. And he's been very upfront about that. He isn't trying to pass judgment nor decree who is more important or deserving. That's all from us fans reading into things that aren't actually there. It makes for a self-fulfilling prophecy when you think about it. And all that this knee-jerk prophesying ends up doing is taking an already tribal atmosphere and cranking it up to 11. It brings the us-against-them mentality underlying it all to the forefront in really ugly ways. And much of that ire is directed toward newer characters, rising stars whose biggest crime is a lack of seniority. Aside from a select few every game who are socially acceptable to support, a lot of newer faces, and their fans, get thrown through the ringer for honestly unfair reasons. And that brings us to our challenger. The face of an undisputable icon of a game that just so happens to wind up on the receiving end of a lot of this hatred. And yet, Pushing past that resentment and the belief that he'd steal a slot from someone else, show a character that, in all honesty, has a lot of potential. And I hope that, now that I have your attention, I can show just why that is. Steve! Steve is the default player character of a little game called Minecraft. You've probably heard of it. A creation of the now-famous company Mojang and originally appearing in demo form in 2009, Minecraft officially released in 2011 and took the world by storm with its simple yet endearing blocky worlds and go-anywhere-do-anything gameplay. The game's seen continuous updates in the years since, even after changing hands to Microsoft in 2014, adding more biomes to explore, enemies to fight, and items and structures to create as time goes on. It's like a cross between an open-world RPG and LEGO, and so no wonder it's been such a monumental success, selling over 154 million copies in total so far, making it the second highest selling video game ever behind only Tetris, and that number's probably not even up to date. It's certainly helped that nowadays it's available on basically every modern platform you can think of, and while it took a while to reach Nintendo's systems, now you can play Minecraft on the Wii U, 3DS, or more importantly, the Switch. So, there are a few points of contention surrounding the idea of Minecraft content in Smash. One being that while it was originally the shining example of an indie game hitting it big, nowadays it's under Microsoft's wing, which basically makes Steve a Microsoft character. With Microsoft technically still competing with Nintendo, there's some unease in some circles about the idea of the two companies collaborating, especially regarding Smash. Microsoft being increasingly willing to bury the hatchet makes this feel more possible than it was in years past, but some are still concerned, and I understand why. But that's not the main reason why Steve is so controversial among so many Smash speculators. You see, he's also seen as direct competition for a different pair of Microsoft characters whose significant parts of the more dedicated fanbase hold near and dear to their hearts. For a lot of 90s kids back in the day, Banjo and Kazooie were a keystone of their childhoods, 
and with how long they've been out of commission and how sour of a note their last outing was, it's left many other fans wishing for them to do something again. The Smash Ballot back in 2015 lit a fire under those hopes, ignited further by Microsoft exec Phil Spencer saying at the time he was open to the idea of collaborating with the Smash developers. So we have two Microsoft candidates here, one already entrenched in the minds of a lot of speculators, and it's led to a lot of resentment aimed at Steve and Minecraft in general, as they're seen by Banjo fans as less deserving. And that us against them mentality has even generated a hate base just for being perceived as getting in the way. For those of us community members well into our 20s or older, Minecraft came around after we'd already grown up, so we don't have the same level of attachment compared to so many of our own childhood favorites. And most of those who do have that attachment are from a younger crowd. It's a situation that sets off alarm bells in some people's heads. This idea that a game we didn't grow up with would be so welcome on Nintendo's biggest stage when other games we did grow up with were left out. And it leads so easily to so much bitterness and hostility. Lest we forget examples we've already seen of a franchise becoming a scapegoat for that kind of thing. And once you mix in the most annoying parts of the Minecraft fandom that everyone knows about because knowledge of such things always spreads, it only spurs this tribalism on further. But, damn it, it doesn't have to be this way. Smash isn't supposed to have us all at each other's throats like this. It's supposed to be this big, grand, unifying crossover of Nintendo's past, present, and future with the occasional non-Nintendo guests as well. A different demographic only becomes the enemy if we brand them as one. Besides, zeroing in on the worst parts of Minecraft's fandom while ignoring how toxic our own can be would be, well, unfair. We know full well that not every Smash fan is some foul-smelling, immature man-child who rages against whichever characters win the most while simultaneously mocking anyone who doesn't main a top tier. So don't you think acting like a different game's fans are all like its worst members is kinda hypocritical? So, how about we take a step back and try to understand the big picture here without jumping to conclusions? Because, all things aside, Steve just might have a legitimate shot at getting into Ultimate's run of DLC. I even think the whole stealing slots argument falls flat, especially since we've already seen multiple characters from the same third-party company join more than once now. I figure, if one of Microsoft's characters with ties to Nintendo did happen to get in right now, it'd still leave the door open for others to join the fight in the long run. Maybe even a quote quote season two if it happens. So can we ease up on all the bad blood? But for now, on to the man of the hour. What would Steve be like if he was chosen to join the fight? How would the limitless potential of Minecraft and the ability to go nearly anywhere and make nearly anything your heart desires be recreated in Smash? His basic look would be the classic. Light blue shirt, dark blue pants, brown hair with a goatee, you name it. Palette swaps could run the gamut from simple color changes to his clothes to more complex stuff that also alters his outfit, eyes, and hair color and hairstyle, or maybe even a few crazier costumes, copyright free of course, to embody all the ridiculous getups players have made for their avatars throughout the years. They could even implement the default female player character Alex as an alt with her own set of skins. Well, I will be referring to Steve by himself from here on out, if Alex showed up as well, everything would also apply to her identically. Wait a minute, you may ask, why aren't you using any armor sets as alts? It'll make sense later, trust me. I've seen a lot of talk regarding animations, and how to implement Minecraft's famously rigid movement in Smash without having it look all weird and uncanny valley-ish. I've even seen it used as a mark against Steve sometimes. However, I think what the Smash team could do is touch up Steve's animations to be somewhat more fluid while still resembling how they look in Minecraft loosely enough to feel like an extension of them. Handle it right and it'd still feel true to the source material and also work fine in Smash. And we know it can be done as various spin-offs have done it, such as Minecraft Story Mode, despite its mixed reputation, and the trailers we've seen so far for the upcoming Minecraft Dungeons. Moving onward, let's talk about the stats and attributes that form the backbone or should I say, bedrock, of how Steve would operate in Smash. His playstyle should, ideally, embody the feel of his game. That is, playing as Steve in Smash should feel a lot like playing Minecraft itself, like a natural extension of what he's already known for. Third-party fighters tend to feel especially true to their source material, as anyone who mains Mega Man or Ryu or Simon can attest to. So, we want to make sure we nail this. Fortunately, it's very doable here. 
will build Steve to be balanced and well-rounded overall, able to handle a wide variety of situations and easily adapt when necessary. He'll also have some dynamic elements that let him temporarily change some stuff about himself in certain situations, similar to other characters with dynamic elements like Lucario's comeback aura, Shulk's Minato arts, Cloud's limit break, and Joker's ability to summon Arsene. The exact nature of those dynamic elements we'll get to later. Now for his stats, which are also pretty balanced. Steve would stand a head taller than Mario, but otherwise be pretty average sized, along with weight that put him smack dab in the center of the scale, along with Pac-Man, Robin, and Roy. It just kinda felt right for him to be a middleweight. Meanwhile, Steve's movement is more on the mediocre side, with only his airspeed coming close to average. Getting around on foot in Minecraft is pretty slow going under normal circumstances, and carrying that over into Smash helps keep him feeling authentic. While he doesn't walk or run particularly quickly and his fall speed is kinda on the floaty side, this wouldn't ruin his viability by any means. Don't believe anyone who tells you otherwise. Especially since he'll have alternative means of covering ground faster. More on that in a bit. Finally, many characters have some kind of overarching gimmick, some unusual property that defines their moveset, like Inkling's ink meter, K. Rool's belly armor, Arsene again, etc. But with Steve, I actually want to lay off having some innate gimmick like that. Oh, rest assured there'll be some crazy stuff, but it'll all be tied to specific parts of his moveset instead. So, what about that moveset? Let's tap into his game's endless potential and craft a kit for Steve that exemplifies all that he's capable of while still feeling clean and coherent and easy to understand. First, let's start with some moves that utilize good old hand-to-hand -hand combat. Steve's jab combo would be a simple one-two punch, doing two hits total like with DK or Bowser. For his dash attack, a shoulder tackle, dealing pretty nice damage yet without much range on it. His grab would just be normal. How does he hold stuff with blocks for hands anyway? And his up throw would be a two-handed underhand toss. And his neutral air could consist of him waving his arms wildly in midair as if trying to stop his fall. It'd be a weak but fast combo breaker with a long-lasting late hit Reminiscent of Mario in similar nares, but with much less finesse. Whatever you do, buddy, don't look down. But what's an aspiring adventurer without a weapon to defend himself? We can also give Steve several attacks using a good old stone pickaxe. His forward tilt would be the classic downward mining swing, replicating the animation and everything. His up tilt would be an overhead swing from back to front with equally stiff movement, and his down tilt would have him swing horizontally across the ground. His forward smash would have him slam his pickaxe down three times in front of him for a multi-hit finishing blow. Would have a more diagonal arc than his forward tilt to emphasize the greater force behind the swings. His forward air would be another downward swing, slower than its tilt counterpart but reaching lower at the end. He'd turn around and perform a quick chop for his back air, faster than his forward air but weaker and with less coverage. For his up air, a back and forth swing overhead. It'd be one long hitbox, dealing a single hit and not two, and it'd be a fairly quick and not very active animation with an arc-shaped hitbox instead of a straight line in order to prevent repeats of, well, you know. Then his down air would be a forceful downward slam with a pickaxe, with as much wind-up as you'd expect, but also spiking anyone who gets hit, also like you'd expect. We could even give him a pummel where he whacks grabbed opponents with his pickaxe as if he's trying to mine them. The whole idea here is that he's kind of improvising, and this is the best thing he can come up with at the moment. Ah, but wait, there's more! Minecraft has all kinds of items and tools you can create and use, so let's work some of them in. Steve's down smash would have him place down a TNT box and cover his pixelated ears as it explodes. A hard-hitting kill option with a circular blast radius, its downside would be its slow startup. His up smash would have him toss a splash potion overhead and have it shatter above him would reach fairly far overhead, not like Palutena up smash height, but still good, and it'd be stronger than my description may make it sound. The potion itself would have the telltale dark red tint of a potion of harming, explaining the power behind it. And for his forward throw, we can have Steve pull out an already loaded dispenser and fire an arrow into his opponent. His back throw would have him take out a piston instead and activate it to send his foe flying for a potential kill throw. And his down throw would use a set of flint and steel to start a fire on his opponent dealing multiple weak hits, and then a final one that knocks him away. It's a fire starter and a combo starter. Finally, we have several options for stuff Steve could use for taunts, such as one where he pulls out a piece of food and eats it to keep his non-existent hunger meter topped off, one where the telltale 
If a creeper plays and he looks around worried, then shrugs his shoulders when one doesn't show up. And finally, one where he puts his hand to his chin, thinking intently about what he wants to do next. We're almost done, but now for the fun part. Steve's B button moves are where his moveset gets real interesting. The means through which his player's creativity would get the means to truly shine. And what better way to exemplify that than by his neutral special being all about that which defines the world of Minecraft, the humble building block. Needless to say, these things are literally everywhere in the game's world and the gameplay revolves around them. And so we're gonna bring a little bit of creative mode into Smash and let Steve place some around. Pressing B has him pull a block about half his size out of hammer space, let go and he'll set it down immediately, but you can hold B and after about 40 frames he'll put the block away and pull out one of a different type. You can cycle between five different blocks this way, each of which take up space and impede opponent's movement unless they get around it by jumping or rolling. They'd even have different levels of durability based on the order they cycle in. The classic grass block with 12 HP, a block of wood with 18, a stone block with 22, a tough as nails obsidian block with 30 HP, and finally a magma block with merely 12 HP like a grass one but with the ability to deal contact damage. While you could technically drop these on someone's head for a little bit of damage, the true purpose of these building blocks is to place them around and essentially alter the stage layout to suit your purposes by adding to it. All kinds of strategies are possible with these things. Would you rather set them down all over the place to impede your opponent's movement on the ground? Stick them on platforms to make them harder to negotiate? Put a barricade up in front of you and be the bane of noobs on quick play? Though be warned, you'd only be able to have three blocks out at a time, only one of them could be obsidian or magma, because they're rare and strong, and any blocks that are stacked would share any damage they take, to keep block walls from being, you know, overpowered. You also wouldn't be able to obstruct the ledge with them because, let's be honest, that'd be broken and we don't want game breakers in our character concepts. For Steve's side special, we use an object not quite so omnipresent in Minecraft, but still iconic. The minecart. And suddenly the background music makes sense. Minecarts on rails are a common way of getting around in Minecraft once you've set them up. But in Smash, Steve is gonna improvise a little. On use, a minecart would appear around Steve along with a small stretch of rail ahead of him on whichever side you pressed. After a short delay, the minecraft would take off and carry Steve forward at high speed. But once you run out of railing, the cart would slow down over time and it'd plummet pretty quickly when over thin air, so you'd have to make sure to jump out before you wound up in a worse situation than you started in. The cart itself would even serve extra utility after you've bailed out, because it'd stick around a little longer until it stopped moving and would still be able to careen into opponents, even ricocheting off any blocks you've placed to do so. The minecart's a bit of an odd duck compared to other side specials built to cover distance, as it's more useful on or near the stage and comparatively less useful as a recovery aid. But its unique effects make it an interesting tool nonetheless, that, when paired with a block setup that works with it, allows for even more creativity. Steve's up special is the most predictable of the bunch, the Ender Pearl. In Minecraft, it serves as a short-range teleport of sorts to traverse difficult terrain. Throw the pearl, and you warp to wherever it lands. And it'd work in more or less the same way in Smash. Steve would wind up, slowing his descent if he's in the air, then hurl an Ender Pearl diagonally up and forward. Once it's traveled far enough, or hits a wall or floor, the pearl breaks and teleports Steve to its position. The pearl itself deals minor damage to foes on contact as it flies, going through them since if it broke on contact with players it'd be laughably easy to edge guard, and it'd do a bigger chunk of damage as you reappear, and you'd even get an extra burst of upward momentum at the end if the pearl hit a wall or horizontal surface to make reaching the ledge a little bit easier. You'd also be able to hold B at the start to charge your throw and send the pearl further, and aim it a bit by holding the control stick in a direction. A useful recovery move, the Ender Pearl could also help traverse the stage in a pinch if you screw up your block setups and accidentally box yourself in. Be warned though, since you're wide open when the teleport happens, you need to think ahead against opponents who get in your face off stage and threaten to hit you too far back for it to save you. Now just what can we do for Steve's down special? Time to bring those dynamic elements in as Steve makes the most out of his crafting skills. Crafting tables are your go-to workstation for making all kinds of things in Minecraft. And in Smash, it'd be a means for Steve to build new equipment for himself on the fly. On use, Steve would plunk a table down and get to work, complete with cliché hammer and saw sound effects. A thought bubble resembling the crafting menu would appear above his head, showing whichever item he's in the progress of making. Let him work for long enough without moving, 
and he'd craft a new tool all on his own. And the longer you let him work, the better item you'd get. Steve would be able to make any of four pieces of equipment this way to serve as temporary buffs, based on the quote quote level of charge he reached before putting the table away. His lowest level upgrade would be a simple iron pickaxe, replacing his default stone one and granting a small damage boost to his tilts, aerials, forward smash, and pummel, all of the moves that use it. At level two, he crafts an iron chest plate for himself instead, granting a minor reduction to any damage he takes for a while. His level three project is a golden helmet, pre-enchanted here with projectile protection and able to completely negate the next few projectiles that hit him. Finally, his level four creation would be a mighty diamond sword, replacing his pickaxe for all attacks that use it for a significant damage boost. You can only have one piece of equipment at a time for obvious balance reasons. If you get hit before you put the crafting table away, you don't get anything, and each upgrade has a set amount of durability, slowly wearing down over time and expending a little more every time you attack with one of the weapons, take damage with the armor, or nullify a projectile with the helmet. The crafting table and the equipment available through it makes Steve even more versatile by allowing players to customize themselves mid-battle. It's up to you to read your situation and decide which buff would help you most. Would you rather arm yourself with your favorite upgrade whenever possible, or vary it up based on the matchup or situation? Now, let's end this with Steve's final smash. And I do mean end. Serving as the closest thing Minecraft has to a final boss, the Ender Dragon's reputation precedes itself, and now Steve can harness its power for his own ends. Channeling the energy of a smash ball, Steve opens a giant end portal behind the stage and the dragon emerges with a fearsome roar as the entire background changes to an ominous dark sky with the only land in sight, a few pitch black towers rising from the abyss. The ender dragon would begin to hover in place awaiting its command and a pixelated target reticle would appear on screen prompting you to choose where to aim. Press another button or wait long enough and the dragon rears back and engulfs the area you choose in shadowy breath that chokes the life out of anyone caught within. And if the Smash team really wanted to go over the top, they could even have the breath instantly kill anyone at over 100% damage, sending them to an all too fitting end. All of this is what Steve would be capable of in Smash. A character of cubes with the world at his fingertips, armed with the tools he carries, and an extension of his player's desire to explore and create. Just like in his game, how you want to play and how you wish to fight and defeat your foes is for you to choose. Steve's strengths lie in his well-rounded and multifaceted abilities, able to adapt to many situations without any glaring Achilles heels to look over your shoulder about. The blocks he generates serve many different purposes, from stage control to locking down opponent movement in certain spots to even creating defensive formations. And crafting equipment for himself lets his players tailor their fighting style to their personal preference or current situation. Just like the Avatar characters in Minecraft, no two Steves would be alike. However, Steve's biggest upsides all require some time and planning to set up, leaving him vulnerable against opponents who keep the pressure on. His mediocre movement and okay but not great range means he'll be at a disadvantage in a straight fight without the right tools. And because of this, he kind of relies on being different and unfamiliar to his opponents. No two Steves would play alike, but it's because they'd have to be different. Losing the element of surprise could mean losing the upper hand. Oh boy, I probably kicked a hornet's nest with this one, didn't I? An awful lot of people really don't like the idea of Minecraft content in Smash. But honestly, I still think Steve is worth talking about despite the hate base. And who knows, maybe I've managed to win over a few skeptics. Personally, I'm completely neutral on the idea of Steve getting in, so while I'm not actively pulling for him, I wouldn't be up in arms if it happened. And I also have nothing against the Baron Bird either. In fact, if one of the two gets in this wave, I see no reason why the other couldn't get into a second wave if we get one. As for those of you who do support Steve, I hope I've done the concept justice. I've only ever played Minecraft casually, so this took some more research than most of my other concepts, and required me to lay low a bit with how some factions of the Smash community resent all things Minecraft so much. But how about you? Are there any games you really like despite their hate bases? Leave a comment and make your voice heard! Special thanks to the guy behind the graphic design who provided the building blocks for this video's layout. Thanks as well to my patrons for sticking with me this whole way. Becoming a patron nets your rewards like design notes for these videos so you can see how I put these concepts together. So check out the description if you're interested, or just wait for the end screen. Well, nice to have this series going again. 
Things have been complicated on my end, but hopefully I can make Challenger approaching more of a recurring thing now. I'm trying to set things up in the long run so that I can make that a reality, so fingers crossed. But until next time... Ah, oh, crap.